As we've gone through the course, we try to do a lot of different experiments. And many experiments, we're, we're really forced to tell the students exactly what to do. A very scripted, almost what sometimes will be referred to as a cookbook type of experiment. And there are very valid safety reasons why we want to know exactly what the students are doing at any given time. But there are times, I think, in chemistry where we can open things up. Now, the buzzwords might be inquiry or open-ended, but problem-based, whatever term you want to use with this. The idea is, is there a way that we can pose a problem to the students that forces them to apply their understanding of a chemistry concept to solve a problem, to produce something. Forcing our students to think in the chemistry lab. It's a very challenging aspect because they're perfectly comfortable, in many cases, uh, simply checking off a series of steps that they followed. And they may not know why step six happens after step five, but they're just following a recipe and in the end, everything turns out well if they follow the directions. Well, this experiment, what I call the test tube challenge, will break that mold. It requires very little in, the, in, the where, in terms of worrying about chemistry, the chemicals. We're talking about using sugar, water, and food coloring. Sugar, water, and food coloring. That's all that they really need in terms of the chemicals. Given the price of sugar, you're buying five pounds of it, on your way into school probably that day, you've got plenty of sugar. The food coloring, not a problem. Tap water, available in most rooms without too much difficulty. When my students would come in, they might see something such as this on the front demo table. And they might say, hey, how did you make that? And the response is, yes. So you're not, yes. If you've got a chemistry textbook that has the classic density gradient, you know, the one with the mercury at the bottom and the bolt that's floating, I'll refer to that picture, maybe have a picture like that on a transparency and say, take a look at that. Wow, sinking, floating, a density type of gradient. But what I try to do is to perhaps show them something like this and then say, hmm, can they produce something similar? But not in a large graduated cylinder, in a test tube. Now, what I've discovered is that many students who are, are honors level students struggle with the idea of applying the concepts. They can manipulate the math, they can solve for any missing variable, but put them in an open-ended situation and they're out of their comfort zone. They'll ask very nicely things like, so how much sugar did you put in the bottom layer? Yes. Well, aren't you gonna answer my question? No. Oh my gosh, how can you be a teacher and not answer questions? Yes. So <laughs> it's important to win over your students. It's important to acknowledge, please do not ask how I made that because I'm not going to tell you. I'm asking you nicely, and they will try multiple times. You've got to stick to your guns. I'm not going to answer that question. What the students are told, I want three clear, distinct layers. Bing, bing, blue, yellow, red. Don't care about the colors themselves, but it makes sense not to go red, 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 okay? Um, but you could go blue, yellow, blue, or however you want. But I need three liquid layers inside a test tube. You can use sugar, water, food coloring, and any equipment in your lab drawer. Anything you guys want to use. Now that's the open-ended problem. But I want you to picture in your mind what can happen if you try to do this open-ended problem if your class, like mine, can accommodate 28 students, we typically do experiments with 14 sets of lab partners. I cannot accommodate 14 sets of how do you do this coming at me all at once. And so I've taken on a system 
where I'll arrange the kids around the room in seven groups of four. I can handle seven sets of questions coming at me. I can monitor seven groups of four. They're assigned to the groups. They're shown this. Sugar, water, food coloring. I need three liquid layers. No solids present in your final test tube. Now, at least where I teach, many times students like to form larger groups, especially on thinking activities. You'll have the corporate merger. This group of four will suddenly start talking to that group of four. Suddenly you have an alliance of eight on one side, an alliance of eight on the other, and then you've got the four kids that you've assigned to a group that maybe they're not even talking to each other. They're just hoping to wait out the storm. Will we work on this tomorrow if nobody gets it? Yes. If you're fortunate enough to be double blocked, I can remember looking out and telling them, you have approximately 83 minutes to go, begin. Now, in terms of the timing, so I've got seven groups of four strategically placed around the room. You can use the lab stations nearest you, and here's how we're going to keep them working in a group of four. What we say in my class, we're going to go plus three, plus two, plus one. What that means is, the first group to successfully finish with three liquid layers in the test tube, three points extra credit for everybody in that group, and then they've got a front row seat to the show while they watch the other group still struggle. They've got the second group to finish, two points extra credit for everybody. The third group, one point extra credit. With seven groups, again, talking teacher to teacher here, three of the seven groups are, should be thinking, we're going to get extra credit on this. This is awesome. I love these thinking type of challenges because they help my grade. The very last group, oh gosh, we're the not so smart group. We're the challenged group. We can't, you can still get a 10 out of 10, but you're racing against the clock. And now you're down to 81 minutes to go. Hurry, you're racing against the clock. You're competing against the other groups for the extra credit, but the very last group can still get a 10 out of 10. So again, it should not hurt their grade. Now if a group gives up, well that's a whole nother story. But my job, once they know what's expected, is to nudge them along the way and do what I have to do. For instance, asking questions like, wow, your top layer and your middle layer are mixing. How much sugar did you put in the bottom layer? And they might say 10 grams, and if they use the same amount of water. So 10 grams are in the bottom layer, two grams are in the middle layer, and then how much is in the top? One gram. So the one gram and the two gram layers are mixing. Yes. Okay, so you had 10 in the bottom, <laughs> then you did two, and then you did one in the top two layers. How did you choose two? Typically, the students will self-correct. Oh my gosh, why did we use that? We probably, oh my gosh, we had 10 in the bottom. Are we required? Are we required to use sugar in every layer? No, I just, sugar, water, food coloring. 10 grams, zero grams, one gram. Once we get zero, five, 10, once they've figured that out, it is a glorious day in the Bracken world when you watch them pour. And they pour with such emotion that the layers can still mix. Oh my gosh, I can't believe. We're teaching persistence. We're teaching problem solving. Remember, I'm walking around the room saying you can use anything you want. You let me know if you need the centrifuge. I've got the centrifuge. I've got microscopes from biology. I've got meter sticks available. They quickly learn we don't actually need that. Stopwatches are right here. Sometimes you'll have kids run up because remember, it's plus three, <laughs> plus two, plus one. I don't know why, but I'm getting a stopwatch. <laughs> I am going to stop the other. In fact, I'm taking all the stopwatches to my. 
I don't know why we need, he wouldn't put it out if we didn't need it, right? Yes, he would. Stirring rods, if they need them, if they're not in their lab drawer, I have other equipment that is available. Do we have to ask you? Yes, you do. And it might be hidden behind the demo table. All right, Joe, that's a really good question. Stirring rods are behind the demo table. Go back there and take, why don't you just put them, no, because every group has to ask for them, because I'm not just telling them what they need. The most critical thing, other than beakers, test tubes, Erlenmeyer flasks, the pipette. So important to their success and their overall happiness. But I will not, as I've done here, have the equipment that they need out for them. They've seen these. They've worked with these. It's their job. Perhaps it's already in their lab drawer. Ah, there we go. If a group, if I look up and I still have maybe five minutes to go and the group is just on the verge of imploding because they haven't been successful, a nice hint to say to, this, to the group is, hey, have you guys used everything in your lab drawer? I wasn't sure if I got everything in the lab drawer that you guys might need. Open up the lab drawer. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, you guys, we need an eye drawer. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we did. Oh, my God. Bing, bing, bing. They're a minute away from cranking it out. Now, it might seem like I'm giving them all the answers. What's amazing is that the plus three, plus two, plus one concept, they're going to work within their group. They're not going to remember the hint like, so how much sugar are you putting in each layer? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, now I understand it. Also... So they take tremendous pride in, in getting, being able to think through a problem and solve it. Some of the fastest students I've had do this, something like 10 minutes. But I'm not going to tell my students that. I'll tell them that the all-time Bracken record is 21 minutes. What that does, if you think about it, they know that they want to hurry, but it also tells them of all the groups that he's had do this, the fastest ones took 21 minutes. That immediately tells them he's expecting us to take some time on this. That, that puts them at ease, and they're able to go after it and be like, hey, did we set the new world record with nine and a half minutes? I think so. Yeah, wow. And then they'll come back the next day. Did anybody beat our time of nine and a half minutes yesterday in your other classes? Um, no, nobody did. Uh, that, that's awesome. So they're, they're very, very proud of their creativity and their problem solving. Now, something that you do have to be aware of, when you do an open-ended lab like this, you're not going to perhaps get the most beautiful results. And that's to be expected. They are, and it's very typical in, in science or in chemistry, we may say, hey, we made aspirin but we were the first ones in the world to make it, and we made it in 4% yield. Okay, four, but we crossed the finish line first. We're number one. Typically what happens, the groups who then say, wow, so that worked, can we tweak it and make it better? They might give you an 80% yield, but they're not gonna be the first ones. So what I love is the group that gets plus three, plus two, plus one, those groups tend not to make the most beautiful bing, bing, bing. It's like giant bing, little tiny bang, and then a bing again. And you go, hey, that's three layers. You guys are the first ones. And so the seventh group, the seventh group of four, the last ones to finish, is ours the best looking one of second period or what? Yes, three equally spaced layers, Still 10 out of 10, we win the best looking test tube uh, category for our class. So I really encourage you to open it up a little bit. Sugar, water, and food coloring, very inexpensive starting materials. Um, it, it is a tremendous amount of fun. Here's one way to actually make it. And I want you to think about, possibly in your own classroom, compare. We can give them the cookbook version. You could probably time it and say they'll all finish in 18 and a half minutes. Why? Because they're all following the exact same set of directions. 
There's not as much thinking if you tell them, for instance, zero grams of sugar into 10 milliliters, add five grams of sugar into 10 milliliters, add 10 grams of sugar into 10 milliliters of water. There's not a lot of thinking involved. To give you an idea, I've watched students try the cookbook approach. My first year of teaching, that's the way I did it. And what some of them did is they went, I added the 10 grams of sugar. Oh, no. I added red food coloring to it. Dump it out. It says it needs to be blue. It's not the student's fault. They're not able to distinguish what is important with what is not important. And sometimes what we even find, the honors kids, who are the ones who are going to get it right, would immediately dump that out because they're saying it's not going to look right and it's not going to work because it needs to be blue on the bottom. The student who may never solve for the missing variable properly probably has the ability to look at that and say it doesn't really matter what color it is. It's simply just to show the different layers. So imagine having to be the referee within the group where they have this discussion and, and the weaker student is saying, hey, I may not be able to calculate the density of those three, but I know first I want to use an eyedropper and, oh yes, because the honors kids will calculate the density values. They will because they've done a density of liquids lab and how could, if you don't calculate the value, Again, students who don't even bring a calculator to class are going, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the stuff with the most sugar, and I'm going to put that in. And again, there's not a lot of thinking involved if this is how we're doing it. Then I'm going to go to the medium density. And again, let them figure out, add it slowly and drop wise. Let them figure it out. Sugar, water, and food coloring. What I'm hoping to create is a classroom where they view the lab idea is a puzzle. It's not an illustration of density where every single density gradient looks the same. Because okay? they take a tremendous amount of pride, even in checking back the next day. Hey, did it all mix? And if you've ever had the misfortune of thinking you're going to teach something on Monday that they'll remember on Tuesday, and they show up acting as if they weren't even there, an activity that they actually remember the second day, and you think, wow, I didn't even know that you would remember doing it and you're check, wanting to check to see if it's mixed. So here we go with the third layer. Now while the students are working on this, I do like to play music in my classroom. And I think music can do a number of things. It can really lighten the mood when the race is on. Okay? It breaks up the silence. And the song that I love to play is by the Archie, Sugar, Sugar. Um, and, and boy, I'll tell you what, I would go to any of the uh, online things, iTunes, whatever you want, and search under Sugar or Sweet and the fact that you have thought ahead and have got music for the event uh, in many cases has, has my students just thinking, is this like your entire life? I mean, how did you actually come up? Yes, I know right where you're going to struggle, and I've got the soundtrack available for the experience. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but we do win them over. We're going to win them over in the matter unit, and this activity, which does, it's heavy on the thinking. Make no mistake about it. Um, Many times, teachers, when they try this, will say, oh, I bet this will take five minutes, and it winds up taking 50 minutes. Because again, it's possible to do it. You saw, I mean, you could even say, let me make the three solutions for the students in advance. If you want it to take five minutes and you want them to all look the same, 
there's a way to do that. But I really think there's real value in letting them do, figure out the importance of the layering, the amount of sugar, the food coloring. It's probably best not to have red and red and red, uh, that they've got to think a little bit about what colors they want to use. Um, lots and lots of fun. It's also important to compliment them, especially if you have uh, some low achieving students. The students, as you assign the kids to the seven different groups, the student that you hoped would participate, and if that student contributed and really led their group, you know, the surprise, wow, I wasn't sure that little Johnny was going to be able to do this, and Johnny was the thinker of the group, that student is going to get a phone call that night, and I can tell you It'll terrify their parents. Oh my gosh, a teacher called our house. Little Johnny will say, I've never had a teacher call our house before. I thought for sure I got in trouble. Was I suspended or what did I do? No, little Johnny wowed his entire group. And I'll tell you what, it's only September and I cannot wait to see what Johnny can do when the chemistry class gets harder. That one minute phone call, two or three years later after they they've no longer have your class, or in some cases, 10 years later, hey, Mr. Bracken, at a graduation party. Mr. Bracken, remember when you called my house after that test tube thing with the layers? That scared my parents so much. That was the only time anybody's ever called my house for a positive thing. If you do that, if you can catch your students doing something right, you own them. They will do anything. You can give them the hardest open-ended problem and their confidence is sky high and they'll just do whatever you ask of them. So I would encourage you to keep that in mind even as a post-lab type of thing. I need 10 minutes to make some phone calls tonight about the, uh, the ones who really surprise me, okay? So test tube challenge, a fun, fun density, open-ended type of lab activity.